George Weigel is an American author, political analyst, social activist. He currently serves as a distinguished senior fellow of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He was the founding president of the James Monroe Foundation. We're talking about uh, his book, The Fragility of Order, Catholic Reflections on Turbulent Times. I have uh, been reading the essays in it. It's really a collection of essays. And it, it really is powerful stuff because he has this vision of what it is that um, makes democracy work and that it's not disconnected from the church. It's not disconnected from Christian belief. And uh, this interview, I could have gone on for another half hour with this interview, but we'll bring him back and talk to him again. Fascinating stuff. George Weigel, thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Nice nice to be here with you. Uh, let, let's start uh, with the big picture uh, from your book. You know, after, after the Cold War, many of us were hopeful that there was going to be a new order coming out of the uh, fall of the Soviet Union. 20 years later, it doesn't look very much like that. What What do you think went wrong? I think a number of things uh, went wrong, Drew. Um, the United States took something of a holiday from history in the 1990s during, during the Clinton administration. And then in the post 9-11 world, I think we failed to understand that this uh, civilizational struggle uh, between the West and and jihadist uh, radical Islam was going to take the better part of several generations uh, to resolve. Uh, We're not a patient people. Uh, We're used to orderliness or at least some degree of it in our own uh, public life. Uh, But we've even seen that uh, come unglued a bit in the last 25 years too. Uh, The post-Cold War world has not been a time of of civic renewal in America. It's been a time of of civic uh, deconstruction and decomposition in in many ways. So uh, we're in a very challenging moment here in the early uh, decades of the 21st century, uh, testing whether the promise of freedom lived nobly uh, that was laid out by, among others, uh, Pope John Paul II, Václav Havel, Uh, other great figures of the revolution of 89, uh, is going to be vindicated uh, in fact. You know, you you write uh, very eloquently about the role that the church, specifically the Catholic church, has to play in supporting democracy and supporting freedom. Can can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I would would broaden the the categories and talk about biblical religion. Uh, I think the civilization of the West is uh, rests uh, is like a stool that rests on three legs. Uh, one of them is Jerusalem, biblical religion, the idea that human life is not just one darn thing after another. It's not cyclical. It's journey. It's pilgrimage. It's adventure. It's heading somewhere. And and within that notion of of journey is a is a, another crucial notion of the dignity of every individual human being made in the image and likeness of God. The second leg of the stool is Athens, Greek, uh, classical Greece, the human faith in reason, uh, the capacity of reason to get at the truth of things. And then the third leg of the stool is uh, Rome, uh, conviction that law uh, rather than brute force is, is the superior way to organize public life. Those are the the building blocks, the foundation stones uh, of the Western world. And we saw how the biblical religion leg uh, can can renew the others uh, during the 1980s. John Paul II uh, was a crucial figure in the collapse of European communism because he ignited a revolution of conscience in which people took the risk, as he put it at the UN in 1995, of of living in the truth, of of living for freedom. And freedom understood something uh, as something more than than doing it my way, uh, to quote the great moral philosopher Frank Sinatra, uh, (laughs) freedom as as common purpose, freedom as noble enterprises uh, jointly uh, engaged in. Uh, The revolution of 1989 in Central and Eastern Europe was a different kind of massive social change because it was informed by by moral truth. We tend to forget that in in the Western world today. We think democracy is a machine that can run by itself. Well, it isn't. 
takes a certain kind of people living certain virtues uh, so that the machinery of democracy uh, produces genuine human flourishing and a society that is building a common good, not just a sum total of little individual goods. So there's so many places I want to unpack that. Let's let's start with this one. Uh, it, it, does this mean, if, if, if this is the center of and the support of our way of life, does this mean that uh, Islam is inherently incompatible uh, with what the West is trying to do? When, when Pope Benedict spoke about this, uh, it started riots around the world and he had to kind of back off a little bit. Uh, do you feel he was right to back off? Do you feel that this is a, a, a fight we have to have? I think Pope Benedict's Regensburg address, uh, to which you're referring, is perhaps the most misunderstood uh, papal uh, speech in, in, in several hundred years. What, what the Pope was saying is that for uh, Islam to live with the rest of the world, it has to develop from within its own religious resources a theory of religious tolerance and a theory of social pluralism. Uh, a theory of the separation of religious and political authority uh, in a just society. That Those two points, can, can Islam develop within itself an understanding of religious tolerance, including the legally protected right to change your religious location, if you will, to convert from one religion to another? And can Islam find a way to legitimize from with again from within itself uh, the distinction between uh, spiritual authority and political authority in a 21st century state. Th those are going to be two very significant developments and they're going to take a while. But they're, those are the right questions and the Pope was right to put them on the table and they ought to keep being pressed uh, today. And there may be some indication that this is beginning to happen. Uh, I mean, we see the beginnings of some wrestling with this, uh, even in Saudi Arabia today, uh, with the crown prince uh, evidently trying to find some path forward beyond this narrow sectarian uh, Salafist form uh, of Islam. Uh, but it's incumbent upon uh, Western people of faith, Jews and Christians, to keep pressing these questions with Islamic interlocutors. I did this in, in Rome last December with a group of Islamic scholars and jurists. Um, and I said, look, it took the Catholic Church about 200 years to come up with a Catholic theory of religious freedom and a Catholic understanding of social pluralism in a democratic post ancien regime world. Uh, it's going to take you guys a while too, but maybe we can help you do that. Uh, hmm. If you understand, if you understand that you're going to have to find these resources from within your own tradition, uh, the notion of some uh, very brave people, I, I think of Ion Hersey Ali, uh, for example, that the only answer to this problem of Islam and the rest of the world is for 1.2 billion uh, Muslims to become good secular liberals uh, is just not a real world prescription. That, that ain't going to happen. So there needs to be some other alternative. Uh, meanwhile, it is terribly important both for our own safety and for the safety of those uh, Muslims who are the primary victims of Islamist and jihadist terrorism, uh, to do everything we can uh, to defeat that uh, scourge of civilization throughout the world. So let, let's bring this home then. It, what about the, the home culture? We have all these fights about uh, gay marriage, for instance, and certainly uh, gay tolerance. I live in Los Angeles where, you know, I, I may be the last straight man uh, walking around. Uh, how, do, how do we balance uh, uh, how do we balance our tolerance with our neighbors, our, our American sense that everybody should be able to do as he pleases in his own home uh, with the need to defend our culture and to keep this uh, biblical religion, as you put it, at the core of our uh, governance? Well, what what biblical religion does for us uh, is it helps us see the world accurately. 
Uh, and so much of our public life today, it seems to me, uh, is confused because of a lack of reality contact. One, one of the essays in this book we're discussing is called The Importance of Reality Contact, Deep Truths and, and Public Policy. If you keep telling yourself, A, that someone can look in the mirror in the morning, see the attributes of a man, say to themselves, I am really a woman, and, and then the rest of us have to salute and say, yes, you are really a woman. We're building a, a society around a lack of reality contact, and that, mm. that, just, can't, that just can't be good. Uh, uh, the aggressiveness of the LGBTQ uh, movement, uh, I think, has to be uh, contested, uh, not least on, on grounds of religious freedom, uh, but also on just grounds of sheer civility. Uh, take the Masterpiece Cake Shop, for example. Uh, that baker won on a very narrow Supreme Court decision because the, Calif the Colorado Civil Rights Commissioners were so blatantly anti-religious that even Stephen Breyer and Elena Kagan could recognize it on the Supreme uh, Court. Uh, but the, the case should never have happened anyway. Uh, there were a gazillion other places that could have baked a cake for that event. Th this was not an assertion of, of someone's civil rights. This was an attempt to use state power to compel Jack Phillips, the owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop, to say, yes, I think this is all great and I'm all for it. That's bullying. Uh, that is what Pope Benedict called the dictatorship of relativism, the use of coercive state power to impose uh, an ethic of I'm okay, you're okay, and nothing's not okay uh, on everybody uh, else. And that is lethal to democracy. So let's move on to the dread question of, of Donald Trump. Uh, when he was running, I think I referred to him as the first post-Christian uh, <laughs> presidential candidate in his emphasis on winning, his attacks on people for not having enough money, his, his bullying uh, aspect. And yet he seems to be doing an actually good job running the country. Can we, as religious believers in, in good faith, uh, support a man who is obviously very personally flawed? Well, uh, there have been lots of personally flawed presidents, senators, representatives, Supreme Court justices, emperors, kings, queens, <laughs> whatever. So yeah, sure. that, that's yeah. called the human condition. Uh, President Trump should be judged on, uh, first of all, on performance. And by that measure, uh, I'm reasonably pleased with some things. I think his judicial nominations have been uh, quite uh, good. Uh, I think his economic policies, including both deregulation and and the tax reform, seem to have uh, gotten the economy back in gear again. Uh, I do think that he let us down badly uh, in Singapore uh, by not addressing the grotesque human rights violations that are a normal part of state policy. Uh, in North Korea, and then by describing this murderous little thug uh, as a talented man with a great personality, whatnot. This is this is just this is really warping reality again. There's a lack of reality contact, and I worry that in his uh, appeals to the base, his base in the United States, he is he's he's aiming low. Uh, I think presidents should aim high. Uh, presidents should summon the American people to live out the noblest of our aspirations, not uh, to live out the basest of our fears. And this uh, this constant appeal to uh, you know a, a nation under assault by what people picking fruit in the Yakima Valley? I don't think so. Uh, there's lots of things assaulting the United States today. Uh, but that's not high on my list of, uh, of uh, problems. So uh, I think it's a mixed picture. Uh, it's, it's certainly better than it would have been uh, under President Hillary Clinton. Uh, 
uh, you might have been interviewing me in Guantanamo. Uh, <laughs> if, if that, Very close, if that yeah, would, yeah. Maybe you'd be there, too. Who <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It would be an easy interview, yeah. I wish that there were uh, more of a summons to nobility rather than an appeal to uh, some very primal fears. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm already out of time, but I have to ask you one last question uh, generated by your original statement. Uh, you were talking about uh, the Pope, uh, Pope John. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a Catholic, but your last two popes were two of the great heroes of my life. Uh, John Paul II, obviously bringing down, helping so much to bring down the Soviet Union. And Benedict, my favorite living theologian, just one of the great reads uh, out there. Not so much your new guy. I mean, where do you feel? Do you feel that the church has taken a step back or is this a necessary lull or what is going on with Francis? I, I think if you look at the living parts of the Catholic Church around the world, whether we're talking about North America uh, or Africa or whatever pockets of vital Catholicism exist in Europe, uh, it's those parts of the church that have embraced uh, John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Uh, if you look at the places where the church is dying, uh, particularly in Western Europe, uh, look at Ireland, for example, uh, it's those parts of the church that are trying to make the failed project of what I call Catholic light, uh, like Coca-Cola light, uh, you know, work, and it doesn't. So that's the empirical reality. Uh, and I think people who admired uh, and esteemed John Paul II and Benedict XVI can take, a, ought to take uh, a lot of comfort uh, from that in the present air turbulence in the church, which I do discuss as well in this book. Uh, the book is The Fragility of Order, Catholic Reflections on Turbulent Times, a collection of terrific essays by George Weigel. George, thank you very much for coming on. I hope you'll come back. Uh, there's a lot of more questions I'd like to ask. I, I'd enjoy that very much. Good to see you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Really good stuff.